Thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining Pleasure. CLY. Thanks for having me. Now, you've been in the telecommunications industry for 20 years now, and you joined CECOM in 2012. What major changes have you implemented since you became the CEO in 2015? Yeah, well, I've been with CECOM for five years, and I think even as far back as 2012 when I arrived, we were going through an evolution. Um, the CECOM was a massive infrastructure project that was built and completed in 2009, uh, and it was the first private cable to land in South Africa as well as countries on the East Coast. Um, and it basically was a construction project. Uh, and I think the changes from 2009 to 2012, and when I joined was the company needed to transition from an infrastructure project to a network service provider. Uh, and I would say we've been going through that migration for the last five years. So previously I was CCO, now CEO. Uh, but in the last two years, the biggest change has been once we had a platform on the network up that was greater than just the linear CECOM uh, cable path, we added some wax capacity, made some investments on the West Coast, we added in some capacity onto other cable systems. Um, we built the platform that was a resilient uh, network. Okay. Uh, and once that happened, that enabled us not only to sell to ISPs who wanted just to plug in to get our IP transit services uh, and plug into the internet, really, uh, yeah. reliably, but it also uh, provided the foundation to move into enterprise, so direct to corporate customers. Because you can't sell to a, to a bank or an insurance company and have, oh, the CECOM cable's cut, sorry, your service is down sure. for two weeks or whatever. Sure. And that does happen. Uh, we do see cuts on cable systems all around the globe in every geography. Uh, every system usually uh, suffers this. So you have to be ready for that to happen and make sure your core customers have resiliency in the networks they're not impacted. So the biggest change really was getting the network into shape to take this next step in CECOM's evolution, which has really been driving into the corporate space in the market. Okay. And CECOM laid the first uh, subsea cable, um, which stretches on the, on the eastern and southern uh, coastlines of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, how has that affected communication or telecommunications in Africa as a whole? Yeah, I think we use a comparative. Really, when CECOM arrived in 2009, there was only one, uh, what we'd say, modern cable. Uh, into South Africa, that was called uh, SAT-3. Yeah. It was laid in 2002. Uh, but obviously at that time, there was kind of an incumbent uh, provider who, while he had that cable capacity, mm -hmm. didn't necessarily disperse it into the marketplace. So uh, most customers were using satellite technology to get links up uh, for the internet connection. Yeah. And uh, I would say the biggest impact was at that price point, people were paying 5,000 US dollars per megabit. Wow. Uh, that wow. price today is less than five dollars per megabit. Wow! So I would say, you know, in that six, seven years since two thousand nine, it took a little while, obviously, yeah. to get into the market. Sure. Uh, that's been the biggest change. And I think okay. if you can't get the cost down to where it's accessible for people, yeah. uh, then they won't be able to use it. And that was yeah. really what was happening. So I think okay. our biggest change is really to bring down the cost of the data transmission infrastructure so that we can provide a better price that allows more adoption. Yeah. And, and what are the challenges that you have um, getting into emerging markets? Yeah, I think uh, building a cable in, in Africa was a challenge in itself. I've, I've been in the industry 20 years, you mentioned, I've built cables all over the world. Yeah. Uh, so Africa, you know, similar challenges, just different geography. Sure. But I think certainly, uh, as everyone's aware, there are some environmental issues where you're going to dig up ground in, under the sea. Uh, and put a cable in. You need a landing station on the shore to receive that okay. cable. Then you need to traverse that cable often through multiple territorial waters. Some of those could be in a state of war, some could be uh, in other, have other issues with ships coming into their waters. So you have to go through a very long uh, application and approval process after you go through the environmental assessments of what you're going to build yeah. and then getting the ships in and out. Mm -hmm. And we have that today when we have a cable uh, outage, uh, we try to stay in international waters as much as possible okay. uh, because that way if we need to send a ship out to repair, it can go to that place and just do what it needs to do, yeah. generally speaking, uh, and there's almost no environmental impact whatsoever. We're just bringing up a cable, replacing a section of it, and putting it back okay. down in the sea. Um, but if you happen to be in the territorial waters in, uh, in the Middle East somewhere, in the Red Sea, in the Mediterranean, near Egypt or other places, it can be quite sensitive to get a ship mm -hmm. in to actually do the repairs work. So do you have ships that are stationed out at sea permanently? We uh, employ a company that okay. covers off certain zones. So okay. in effect, we have our spares, in other words, kit that would pair our subsea cable because sure. it's quite unique on that ship. It may have three other companies' spares on that ship as well. Okay. But if we have an outage, we call them, they go fix it. Yeah. Okay. So they work on us like a retainer basis. Okay. Always there to repair.
And how long does it take, or how long did it take to lay the cable from Europe all the way around to yeah, South the, Africa? The, uh, the, the project was about two years. Wow. Um, but a lot of that is the application, the permitting, and you're hopefully doing that while the cable is getting yeah. constructed. Because it does take a long time for the cable to get yeah. constructed. Once the cable is on the ship and is getting deployed, the things that take the longest are usually the shore end. So when okay. we say a shore end, it means landing that yes. cable because often you have to plow it under the sand, bring it up into a manhole, and then into the cable yeah. station. Once you're out in deep sea, the ship can kind of go along at two or three knots and just feed the cable out. Okay. Um, so and it I takes pretty quick once you get it going. And you're dealing with so many different countries. There's, there's a lot of permits you have to get. Different. Uh, yeah, well, we land in uh, five countries and then over into India with a partner uh, yeah. and uh, into Europe. Air Europe's quite easy to do, but again, there you have the environmental impact statements, things like mm -hmm. that. There's certain corridors that are marked off for, okay. uh, for landing cables. But yeah, not only are you landing in countries, but you're actually going through the waters mm -hmm. of other countries, yeah. which adds even more complication sure. to it. Right. Um, what opportunities does Seacom bring to Africa? Well, I think the, the opportunities here in Africa, uh, not just South Africa, but all over the, the markets that we work in are, are tremendous. Uh, you know, I think I read a report that fiber penetration to the commercial building in the United States just reached 50%. Wow. Uh, in South Africa, which is probably obviously one of the most developed markets uh, in Africa, uh, I said, I, the same article said that the penetration was 4%. Wow. Okay. So I think you know that alone says you know there's a long way to go. I mean yeah. we we kind of believe in fiber at least, and when you really talk about cloud applications and larger corporations wanting to do things uh, yeah. going forward, sure. fiber is necessary just to get the cost of the transmission of data down, uh, as well as the reliability of the, the connections. I think for home users that's a different story. I was talking about commercial space. So yeah. we're focused on actually continuing to support our our service provider customers and partners. Uh, so that they can grow their business. They may be offering services to the home or services to the consumer. Uh, but we are predominantly focused on guys who really want large-scale bandwidth, uh, scalable bandwidth mm. and international uh, connectivity that can enable cloud-based applications. So we're kind of targeting kind of the middle to larger corporates uh, in the marketplace. And I think we see a huge opportunity there that will continue to grow just because mm. we see everywhere that the, the bandwidth requirements continue to grow and the services that you can layer on top of that continue to grow. Yeah. Well, you just answered my final question. Where do you see Seacom in the future? <laughs> yeah.